So on the right is a piece, a plaque by Kate Godshaw, who in 1990 was practicing as more of a traditional China painter. And I think I mentioned earlier there are two international organizations based in the United States. One is in Oklahoma City and the other one near Dallas that are clubs or organizations where these China painters, traditional China painters, still hang out. And they have annual national, international, and regional get-togethers where they show their China painting and they trade treatments and they have China colors with their names attached to them and so forth. And um, it's all just like it was 100 years ago. I love what they wear. They, still, they don't know, they don't wear old fashioned clothes. But they, pra they still practice the art exactly the way it was constituted in the 1880s and 1890s. Those of you who are leaving early are missing the really fun part of this lecture. <laughs> In 1972, Judy Chicago, and you know I promised from the beginning that we would get to Chicago. <laughs> Judy Chicago found in the cluttered interior of an antique shop on the Northwest Coast what she described as a, quote, beautiful porcelain plate painted with the most delectable roses. I've always imagined it looked like this one. Although she didn't buy the plate, its color haunted her and led her eventually to investigate not only the techniques of painting on China, but the history of China painting in America. Thinking critically about the contemporary manifestations of the art and what they have to reveal about the women who are organized around it. She um, was so fascinated by this plate that she sought out a traditional China painting class so that she could learn how to use and make, these, make and use these colors herself. Chicago's insight into the, insights into the practice of working and teaching in public, because that's the way this art is still transferred in public classes, of building an art on 19th century rather than 20th century values, and of the poignancy of women painters embellishing the domestic objects they do not make are fascinating. But the effect of her investigations on her own work, particularly her controversial dinner party, which was finished in 1977, are astounding. She wrote about all of this, her finding the China plate her, and her coming to these conclusions about China painting and its role in women's lives in a, an, an essay uh, in a little known publication called Overglazed Imagery, which was published in, I've forgotten the year, in uh, Southern California, I think in the early 1980s, where she talks about that. For this monumental work, The Dinner Party, Chicago chose two crafts, needlework and ceramics, at which women had distinguished themselves over a long period of time and which also, by the way, are generally practiced in groups. And for the needlework part, I would say if you consider quilt making as generally a group activity, China painting has all, all often been a group practiced as a group activity as well. She interpreted the history of women by choosing illustrious individuals and creating table settings for each of them in ceramics and needlework. Moreover, Chicago assembled women, many from among the so-called amateurs she had met in learning the two crafts, to work on this project as a group. And uh, she, she, this piece has been assailed for being a group project, and yet that was basically what she was getting at, is that the history of women practicing art um, is often practicing it as a group. <coughs> Judy Chicago's interest in China painting did not develop in a complete vacuum. Indeed, other West Coast ceramists were looking at color in a new way 
as, as the taste for Japanese ceramics as a source for their art in the 1940s and 50s gave way to new influences from canvas painting and, from of all places, China painting. Ron Nagel, whose mother was a China painter, began working in China paints and luster glazes himself in the early 1960s. Along with Jim Melford, he changed the ceramic department at the San Francisco Art Institute from a stoneware shop into a low fire facility and influenced a generation to use color in their work. I could also have included here the ceramics of Patty Warashina and Viola Fry, among many more contemporary clay artists. And uh, here's a covered jar by Kurt Weiser. Also, oh, Sergei Isipov is a very popular China painter today. Popular maybe is not the right word, but esteemed. Esteemed, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I could have included lots more work uh, there. And uh, all of this work featured cool colors on hot bodies. But time is running out, and this would be a whole lecture in itself to go into how many artists have chosen to go down the color road uh, rather than the um, brown pottery of the <coughs> Japanese. Suffice it to say that there's much to be learned about the history of women making art, of the development of the studio ceramics movement in America, and of the evolving role of color in ceramic art simply by tracing the lines of descent from the little teacups. Painted so innocently by the ladies of Cincinnati in 1875 to, to the fabled plates of Judy Chicago's dinner party 100 years later. Thank you. <laughs>